The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. 10.15 is the start time, right? Yes. Good? All right. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so uh, my session's called uh, Learn, to Learn to Be a Coding Rockstar. I keep changing it. It's all marketing. Um, so I just passed around DevCloud subscriptions for everyone. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Again, it's a three-month trial. Can't lose. <laughs> Um, I also have a whole bunch of other giveaway, other goodies to give away and all kinds of stuff. We're hiring like crazy, so if you're interested, come see me either between these sessions or after my second session. Uh, we'll talk. We're hiring for everything from sales, marketing, support, consulting, engineering, absolutely everything you can think of. Um, all right, so this is basically focused around doing... Uh, what I call Drupal design patterns. It's not design patterns in the typical coding sense, but it's things you see over and over in Drupal, things that are really helpful for getting really efficient code and just following along the lines of how everyone else is developing it. So you can sort of start on a common playing field. Um, I'm a technical consultant at Acquia. I focus primarily on best practices in the greater sense of the word and as well as infrastructure setup. Um, I've been working with Drupal for a little over, almost four years now, actually. Um, I've been doing PHP for about 10 years, and I'm a Red Hat admin for about the last six, seven years. Um, so I have a pretty wide range of the whole Drupal ecosystem. So there's five things I want to talk about. One, creating your own hooks. Um, also, how do you use static variables? This is something, again, all of these examples are just things I rarely see people using and all the clients I go to, just really good performance things they could be doing but aren't. Um, so this is my way of sort of imparting that back on other people. Um, also using Drupal's cache. This is another one that I think there's sort of a fear around it or people just aren't comfortable using it. Um, it's really not that hard and we'll go through some examples. Um, how to effectively store objects in a database. So um, basically how to effectively write to the database without writing field by field and just these huge SQL commands, Don't, not having to write those by hand. And also making the most of menus. So there's a couple of menu tricks that I'll show you guys that um, I think are pretty cool. And none of these are very well documented anywhere. A lot of this you just learn from reading other people's code, reading good maintainer's code. So I know these aren't design patterns. I've had people other times giving me these giving these presentations that are very upset that I call these design patterns. So just as a disclaimer, this is not like computer science, strict design patterns. Um, all right, so first one we're gonna take a look at is creating your own hooks. Um, so everyone knows what a Drupal hook is, right? Anyone? Okay, good. Um, so the way I look at it, there's four different types of hooks. Um, this is sort of by my definition, not really necessarily anything that's out there. Um, there's action hooks, aggregate hooks, alter hooks, and attribute hooks. So we'll look at each one of these. Um, so how do you use them? There's also several methods of actually invoking hooks. There's just the simple way, which most people never need. Um, there's aggregating results, which is calling all hooks and getting all that data back in one form. Uh, altering data, so you can actually take an object, pass it through, and make any changes you want as you go. And also passing by reference, which is um, slightly different than altering data. And I'll explain why. So simple invoking, probably everyone's seen an example like this. That's all it takes. Um, you can create your own hook using that method. You can call it whatever you want. This is all Drupal needs. There's no sort of way to define hooks. They just exist. Um, so this is the simplest way to call hooks for any module. Um, 
exactly. So there's no there's no sort of setup you have to do for hooks. They just they're there. It's just all Drupal does is match module name underscore hook name, and that's all it does. Uh, so there's nothing really there's nothing really strict about it. You can call hooks whatever you want. Use them how you need them. Um, aggregating results. Uh, this is an example where maybe you want to collect everything. This is something like what views does. The views default views hook where it'll loop through all the modules and just make one big array of everything that's available. And this is a great way to extend your modules. I know the flag module does this. Um, there's a lot of modules that take this approach. And this is just sort of the simplest version of that. So module implements actually scans the functions and finds which modules actually have that hook. So altering data, this is one, I don't know if I've ever seen custom code have this. This is all you need to do to pass an object through um, hooks. So it'll call hook my data in every module with that one object, and it'll just get changed to each one. You don't have to do any looping or anything. Drupal alters all you need. This is this is a good one that, again, I don't see people use, but it's it's extremely extremely effective. menu, all those. Um, by reference is a little bit different um, because it can pass multiple things by reference. This is what user module invoke does. This is probably the only place that follows this pattern, but just so you know it's there. Um, basically, so you can pass multiple arguments where Drupal alter kind of falls short in that way. This is definitely an edge case, but it's out there, so um, it's good to know about. So this is definitely jam-packed with information. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to just blurt them out. It's going to be more efficient. I'm sure you'll get more out of it that way. Um, also looking at static variables. A little cute little hamster with static electricity, of course. Uh, so does everyone know what a static variable is in PHP or any programming language? Everyone have a basic idea? Okay. Um, it's just a PHP feature. Um, in Drupal 6, it was strictly PHP. In Drupal 7, there's a little, little wrinkle to that. Um, this is for speeding things up within a request. So if you have a function that's called a thousand times a request, a hundred times a request, you should use static variables for that. This is to speed up a commonly called request. Something like node load, for instance, uses static variables. So here's a simple example. This is the simple, just PHP way to do it. So we have a static variable. If it is set, or if it's not set, you actually just set a value for it, and then you return at the end. Simplest example of how to use one. This is this can actually have a really significant improvement on performance because if you have database queries in here, if you have web service calls, if you have anything like that, it's going to skip all of that. And how often does most data change within a request? It's not very often. So static variables are very the same. So Drupal 7 makes this a little bit more interesting. There's now a Drupal static function. And what this does is it actually creates a, basically a hash of all the static variables within Drupal. And the reason this is cool is because of this. You can actually reset the static variable of another function. For instance, I mentioned node loads are stored in static variables. When you save a node, how do you clear that static variable? That was a problem in Drupal 6 that had all kinds of nasty solutions for. Well now, all you have to do is call Drupal static reset and reset that node static variable. So you get the benefits of both. You have static variables to improve performance, but at the same time, it's actually controllable outside of that function. So Drupal's cache. This is one of the biggest things I would suggest everyone doing in their modules is using the cache. Um, it's super easy to use, and the performance improvements can be really, really severe, especially when you actually team this with new cache or you may be seeing for cache, something like that, where you're not even hitting the database, you're not even processing anything. You can have a pretty significant improvement using the cache. 
So this is for duplicate work between requests, not within a request. So in other words, static requests, static variables should be used if it's user specific, if it's something that changes often. The Drupal cache should be used for things that don't change very often, that are helper calls like um, views does caching where all of those, where it generates all those views and looks at everything that's available, it caches that because it doesn't want to have to do that in every request. Um, things like going out to web services and getting back information that's general to your website, but not specific to a request. The caching system is great for that. This is, the big one here is complicated is one thing, but PHP optimizes that relatively well. It's the remote functions that's a really big deal. For instance, if, if you need to go and get a new token for a web service every 24 hours, or um, you, you need to make sure that some sort of web service is available, or checking the status of another website, those are great examples of when you should use a caching system. And these get even more beneficial as you use something like them cache. You could have 10 different web servers and be helping all of those from reusing the cache. Um, and the biggest thing is, cache is always right to the database. The less writes you get the database, the better. So even if there's no sort of speed improvement necessarily to think there'll be, just moving that off the database can really help. Once you see sites with hundreds of thousands, millions of hits, just moving the cache out of the database can have a really, really significant improvement. Losing 20 or 30 percent of the database work in every day, so it can be it can be pretty significant. And also, this should only be a simple So anything that you can lose and regenerate, never store anything valuable in here. The cache could theoretically go away at any moment, and there needs to be a clean way to actually regenerate that. Um, so that's the only real caveat here, but. Um, you can get the benefit of extremely fast caching techniques, so it's more than worth it. Um, so the cache revolves just around cache set, cache get. There's only two functions. So there's three ways to use this. So cache permanent means it'll stay in the cache until you manually clear it, or you specifically clear it. Cache temporary will go away at the next cache clear. And Unix timestamp means it'll stay in the cache at least until that timestamp. And then we'll go away the next cache code. So this would be an example of something where if you need to go out to some external token, external service is going to token every six hours, every 12 hours, every 24 hours. You can set this to six hours now. And that way you never have to regenerate it over that time frame. Just keep flash. Will you cache all clear the permanent stuff? No. It, it, that's only cleared individually. So you actually have to say like cache set specific key with no data. <coughs> so I, that's something you definitely use sparingly. Um, but that's something I think the variables table uses cache permanent because you, it's always triggered if there's ever a change that's made. Menu, I believe, also. Um, I'm not sure about menu, but the ones where there's always be some trigger that needs to know when the cache gets reset, because obviously that's going to be the most performant. It's not going to go away. So here's a basic usage example. You try to get it. If you don't get it, then you set it. You get the new value. So can anyone explain to me why you should do that? What? And I return zero and the number is false. But in that order, why you put false first? Did you not get error if the value doesn't exist? So what if I accidentally did a type of the one equals sign here? What would happen? Value uh, no, equals false. Yes. Yeah, so the value no, false is first and fail. Uh -huh. So this is a great way to eliminate that possible typo. If you do false single equals value, it'll error. If you do value single equal false, you're gonna have to track down the value. So this is a great little, great little tip for that. 
So creating our guys will be breaking this down a couple of steps. So big, long, scary function name. All this says is get the cache table schema. That's all it's doing. Um, and then I can create my own called cache my cache. And this is kind of what you're asking, is if you create your own table, or similar to what you're asking, if you create your own table, it won't be cleared automatically. You have to tell it you want it to be cleared. So some of the cache tables out there, that's why they don't respond to cache clear all because they work sort of in their own little area. Um, the only time you really, I don't see any reason why most people would ever need this. It's more of, if you really need to organize your own into a very specific expiration, or you have a lot of cache entries you're gonna reuse over and over. So storing objects in the database, this is a, this is a fun one. Most people, this is, this one I also get a lot of comments on because most people are all up in arms. No, you should not be putting objects anywhere in the database. It's not normalized. Yada yada yada. Um, there's a right time and there's certainly a wrong time. Um, so Drupal right record, I'm sure most of you guys have probably seen this at some point. Um, basically, this just takes all of your, it takes an object and writes it column by column into the database. It's the simplest way to do it. It's best for just single state inserts and updates, so load an object, modify it in some way, save it back. Very simple, that's all it's really designed for. Um, and there's a new, in Drupal 7, the new database engine, there's actually a fetch style. So in Drupal 6, you're probably used to seeing like db fetch object and db fetch array. Uh, now in Drupal 7, the default is everything comes back as so just, that's one of those gotchas when you're recording modules, is now all of a sudden everything's an object. Uh, just something to watch out for. So just to illustrate this, I'm gonna create a real simple table just to, just so we know what we're working with. All I'm doing is giving ID and value. ID is a serial integer. Value is just some string. Um, just so we know we're all in the same place. So as an example, I'm going to create a day object with an ID and a value. And what Drupal Write Record does, this is actually a pattern you see all over the place. This is what nodes do, users do, taxonomies, anything that is an object that may or not may or may not have been loaded. Instead of creating two whole routines, it does this. So basically, if you set an ID, it assumes it already exists, and you do a write record based on the ID. So you can see this is automatically doing an update and checking that the ID exists. If you just comment on ID, right record will know, okay, that's new. I'm going to do an insert on it. And then it sets it. So this is actually by reference. Um, so if you have your own table that you're using, this is a super easy way to load something, make whatever change you want, and resave it, and practically no code at all not having to deal with SQL or type matching or any of that stuff. So serializing is pretty cool. Serializing is um, all those nasty patterns you see in the cache table for the most part. Uh, Drupal does this automatically. So you don't have to worry about, I see a lot of people calling serialize and unserialize, saving that, loading it up, Unserializing it when they load, you're doing all kinds of unnecessary stuff. You can actually define it straight in the schema you got. All you do is set the serialized property in that column to true. So every time you call the database, it'll come back as a, an actual object instead of a string that's serialized. Um, so that's actually a, the schema you got has a lot of features that most people don't know about, but it's a certain one that kind of slips under the radar. It, it natively uses serialize and unserialize, so there's nothing really special going on there. Uh, it's fully optimized in the way PHP does things. It follows a normal format. And this is best used when you just have additional options for an object. Obviously, once it's in that object in the database, in that form, you can't search for it. You can't, you can't select it in where clause, anything like that. It's just for sort of variable options. So for instance, the user table does this. If 
there's some attribute of the user you just want to say. You don't care if it needs to be in the database because you're not searching for it. There's no need for an index. There's a column in there that just stores serialized objects, um, options for a user. Um, there's some other places to using it, but that's the primary use for the serializing part of this. And also cache does it as well. And this really simplifies the schema. So although this may not be normalized, there's also something to be said for not having 40 columns in the table where for any one element there may only be four values. So that's the trade-off there. So I expand on the schema a little bit. So all I'm doing is adding an options, options field here. And you see I have this serialized property such true. That's all I need to do. And now I have something that will dynamically serialize and unserialize whatever I save to it. So again, the same pattern as before. But all I'm doing is now there's an options here, which is an array. And this looks exactly the same as before. That's all, that's all the work you have to do to put an array, a class, any sort of advanced data structure into the database. And Drupal Write Record handles all that for you. Um, it looks at the Steam API, it figures out types, it figures out what to escape. Anytime you can use Drupal Write Record, it'll save you a lot of work. So, so most people know the menu system because they wrote some, something in their hook menu, they did a menu alter, and it won't show up. Most people just know the menu because it's that thing you have to cache when, you, when your site's not working. That's how most people see it. Um, so one of the cool things is page arguments. This is something I see fairly often. This allows you to reuse callbacks. And it basically just creates an array out of the different URL parts. So for instance, if you have, you see like node, node ID, edit, that's node is zero, node ID is one, edit is two. And this is one I really hope no one uses. Who uses R? Anyone? So what happens when you want to change the URL? You have to change the R in every place you're using it. So I'll show examples of this and this. So there's also title callbacks. So by default, most people never use title callbacks because it just uses a T function, which is fine for most people. But there's a lot of cool things you can do with this with creating dynamic titles. So think about like the node page, right? That node menu item, it doesn't have a title because it's different for every single node. So it has a title callback that actually takes a node object, does some logic, and figures out what the title should be. So if you have any sort of page with dynamic titles, title callbacks is a really, really simple way to accomplish that. And this is another one that um, can get kind of messy. It's Drupal set title. Um, mainly because it's just a bug that's kind of hard to track down. You forget you ever did it. A lot of times it's hidden in the theme somewhere. Um, it has its use, but you just try to avoid as much as possible. So this is very noticeable about functions. Anyone? Okay. Um, so this is one is I don't think it's actually documented anywhere. Even in the API, it's not actually explicitly written out what it is. Um, if you look at it, if you've ever looked at the menu table or looked at the node module or user module, you see something that says like node percent sign node edit, right? That percent sign node is a load function. What this does is it passes out, it passes that argument in the URL to another function automatically. And it automatically adds load to the argument. Then. So if someone can point me to where that's documented, I would be really glad because it Probably took me six months to figure out where that was. It's in the book menu. There's like a paragraph. I was just reading it last week. It actually, it actually says it depends on the square load of it. 
and it tells you it depends, I guess, whatever module you want to call as the load. And so what happens is if you have the percent sign node, it actually calls node load. If you have percent sign user, it calls user load, which I think is a little odd because then you're basically calling one of these weird pseudo hooks in Drupal where percent underscore load means something, but not always. Um, and it helps remove redundant code. So if you've written our, if you've written URLs where you have arguments in the URL, a lot of times you'll see people pull out the argument, make some database call, and get an object out of it. Load functions can do all that automatically for you. And it allows you to send objects to the page callback. So instead of the page callback doing work itself, it can just assume there's an object there waiting for it. So here's an example. So I have my module data here as the load function, which gives me my module data load when I need to. So my data is going to be whatever's in the URL. So let's say it's you know, data one, right? So this argument will be data one. It's going to do some lookup, and now there's an object. And that actually gets passed through the whole menu system. So when you get down to the page callback, it's already an object. You don't have to do that lookup every time. So for instance, if you write some module that needs to do a node load, all you have to do is a percent node in the URL, and it'll automatically turn that into a node object for you. Same with users, same with any of those items. Um, so it, this can save you a lot of work. And um, I mean, maybe the underscore load thing, maybe I added that or just missed it, but it's, it's definitely hidden in there. I don't understand it. I was just recently reading it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it has sort of a specific use case, but if you're using anything that has your own data objects, or you want to use nodes or users in your URL, this is a great shortcut, so you don't have to call the node loads and user loads yourself. So let's put it all together into a big example. Um, so I'm sure a lot, this is a lot of information. I actually have all this online. Um, there's actually bigger explanations for every topic. I have the address thing at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'm not, I'm not expecting everyone to get to everything now. I'd rather put all the information in here and uh, just give you large write-ups online. So don't, don't feel like you missed them in there yet. Um, so this is putting all together, this is the hook page. There, or this is part of the hook page. So what I'm actually doing here is this is an example of how to write your own explorables for a module. So this is, we have a my module which just lists everything. We have a my module with a particular key which lists one thing. You notice the callbacks are the same. I have a view here, which this is basically just saying if there is no slide, if there's nothing after my module data, it just falls here. You know, for what's the to that. Um, but I also have an export. So my module, some key, export. And that's a completely different callback but they're all going to be using the exact same load functions, so I can write those three lines of code once. So I'm going to use static functions here to get all of my data structures. So if, if there is my module data, if, that's, if we've already called that, it'll return immediately. If not, what it does is actually, well, so this is, this is Drupal 7 code. This is what the new database engine looks like. So I'm going to select everything from my table and just get everything, just from one table, just that whole structure. And then I'm going to do the aggregate hook, like I explained earlier, um, and do the module invoke on this hook with that, and uh, get it for every single module and put it all together. So the magic that you guys see with views or something, where if you make a database change, and that sticks, that overrides what's in code. This is all views does. So what this is saying is merge the what's in code into what is in the database. So this code is essentially what views does. Obviously it's a little more expanded, um, but this will work exactly the same. So a couple more functions. So we have the load. 
this is so in Drupal 7, the Out there, 
and as people work on it, they can add their own. I mean, I don't think views would have the ecosystem it does now if everything couldn't get overridden like it can be. So this is the URL where I have all five of those tips, I guess. I have fully expanded with those code snippets, um, long multi-paragraph explanations of what's going on. Uh, if you go to this page, um, it's actually broken down into links to the other five topics. Eric, can you go back to that? I think you are on. Yeah, I'm just click on the.
about this? I can help with I like that. It. Can I help you? We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found idea. a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really? Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. An OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.